Hi folks, welcome to the Easy Agile podcast. My name is Nick Muldoon. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO at Easy Agile. And today I'm joined with two wonderful guests, Eric Nyberg, the Chief Operating Officer at Scrum.org and Dave West, the Chief Executive Officer at Scrum.org. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which we broadcast today, um, the people of the Darawal speaking country. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend the same respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people that are joining us today. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for making some time. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you. I guess um, I, I'd love to just jump in and Dave, I've got a question for you first and a follow on for you, Eric. Um, I, I'd love to just get a quick assessment, Dave, of the agile landscape today and, um, and I guess the shifts that you may have seen now that we're out of these COVID lockdowns, these back and forth COVID lockdowns. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I've been uh, the CEO almost eight years here at scrum.org and um, it has changed a bit during those eight years. Um, I think what we're seeing and is a, dare I say the deployment phase, a mass deployment of, of these agile ways of working in this agile mindset throughout industries and throughout organizations. It's more than an IT software development thing. Uh, and I think that that was accelerated during COVID. Um, what's interesting though, is many of the characteristics of agile that became so uh, important during COVID, uh, particularly around empowered teams, particularly around trust, particularly around um, the hierarchy and the reduction of hierarchy, some of those things are being challenged as we return to the new normal, which some people would rather was just the normal, you know? Um, so I, I am seeing some of that. Um, however, generally, Agile is here. It's, it's here to stay. I think the reality is that most knowledge workers, particularly those knowledge workers dealing in complex work, are going to be using some kind of agile kind of approach um, for the foreseeable future. And and last week you were, was it last week? I believe you were in Paris for the first face We we we. I was, and it rained the entire time actually, Nick. So uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time inside in Paris. <laughs> Well, what was, what was the sentiment from the, the scrum trainers there, from the conversations they're having? Yeah, it, it was interesting. We, we talked a lot about at scale, enterprise adoption, the challenges. <laughs> it is funny that the, the challenges are challenges that you expect, and most of them are about people, legacy, mm. systems, people, status, power, position. We talked a lot about the challenges that teams are getting in these large complicated organizations um, that continues to be the conversation um, there is obviously you know this is europe they're very close to uh, ukraine and mm -hmm. the the conflict there so there's definitely some conversations about that we have six um um, Ukrainian trainers and also uh, about the same number of Russian trainers as well. So that's always a conversation. Um, and then there's a general sort of downturn of the economy that was also being talked about. Um, layoffs are happening throughout Europe um, and particularly in the technology sector, but, but I think that's growing to some extent. Vodafone, um, just announced today that they were laying off uh, it's about 6,000 employees and they're one of the biggest telecommunication companies in Germany, yeah. for instance. You know, so there was definitely some of that, but the, so if you add enterprise, you add conflict uncertainty, you add economic uncertainty, those three sort of things were, were all come together. But what was funny in it is that throughout all of this, they were incredibly upbeat and excited. And mm. I think, because they're talking to people that they've never spoken to before. They're talking to people about how Scrum is a natural way of working, talking about the challenges of empowered teams, empiricism, continuous improvement. And, you know, I, I had some really exciting conversations with trainers who are like, yeah, well, we're doing this in this um, aerospace company or this 
electric car supplier, you know, sort of in Germany or whatever, or this uh, financial services startup, you know, that's using um, blockchain for the first time. And of course they're using agile. And so there was, it was funny. It was almost as though all of those things, though they were the backdrop, it was still incredibly positive. So this is, this is interesting. And I guess if I reflect on the background for both of you, Eric, I'm, you know, I'm looking at uh, like you two have worked together from rational days, um, a few times, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the prevalence of the agile, like I would describe you two as agile natives. And, and it sounds like Dave, you know, you've got your tribe there in, in Paris last week that are agile natives. Um, and I, and I guess, you know, Eric, for you, like, what's the sense around the people that, that you're interacting with from a leadership perspective in these companies, you know, do you, can you identify the agile natives or, you know, yeah, I guess, is it, is it an easier conversation if you've got agile natives and leadership levels? It's definitely an easier conversation if they're there. Uh, sometimes they're in hiding. Sometimes they're, um, they're, they're not agile natives masquerading as agile natives as well, um, mm -hmm. which always makes it a little bit difficult because you have to kind of peel back that onion and peel through who are they and what's their real agenda. Um, I was talking to a, a, a CIO uh, last week, and he was talking about the, the typical CIO last two to three years. So, you know, what is their real agenda? Right. What are they trying to achieve? And, and, and you know, Dave mentioned the you know, people part of this, and people often become the, the, the hardest part of, of any agile transformation or working in an agile way. Uh, people want to protect themselves. They want to protect their turf. They want to do the things that, that they need to do to be successful as well. Um, so so it, it, you, you see that as, as talking to leaders within organizations and they want to do better. They want to improve. They want to deliver faster, but they've still got that pressure. Um, organizations, at least large organizations, haven't changed. They still mm. have boards and they still report to those boards and those boards yeah. still have their agendas as well. I rem you're making me recall a conversation that I had. This is several years ago, but on a trip through Europe, and it was with the agile native that was the agile practice lead and, and probably wasn't masking, like probably was legitimately an, an agile native, yet they were talking about the mixed incentives for their, maybe not their direct leader, but like the VP further up. Right. And it was, it was actually a, I don't want to say a zero sum game, but it was, there was some kind of like fiefdom thing going where the various VPs would fight for resources, people, whatever, because that would, that would unlock further bonus. But at the end of the day, it was not like optimizing the entire financial services company. You know, are we still seeing that today? Oh, very much so. In fact, you know, the, the, a, a colleague of ours uh, says, um, you know, science used to have a saying, science progresses one funeral at a time. And, mm -hmm. and I think agile definitely has some of that, not funerals, hopefully, but re a retirements. Retirements, at a time. yeah. Yeah. The, the reality is that when you don't have incentives aligned, where you don't have teams aligned to those incentives and leadership aligned to those consistent incentives, then you're, you're going to always be dealing with some challenges. What's so frustrating is we all know the industrial revolution and particularly the recent revolution of mass production and oil, which is just happened sort of in the deployment phase just after the second world war was, was enabled by changing working practices uh, created by people like Ford and Deming and all of these people, right? We, we all know that the digital revolution is happening around us. You know, it, it may even pass us if you believe the AI buzz that's happening. You know, we, we may be put to the side and computers may just take over, but this digital ha is happening and you're in with leaders and they're like, yeah, 
totally respect that. We're going to be 100% digital. You know, we're a, we're an airline, but really we're a, we're a digital company with wings. You know, they describe themselves in this way, and then they don't want to challenge the fundamentals of how authority, how value is managed, how risk is 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 made transparent, how governance is it happens, how funding is made and you know planning, etc. They don't want to challenge any of those assumptions. They like that the way it is, but we're going digital. It, it is sort of ironic that that it still is happening. However, that isn't totally 100%. The organizations that get it, the organizations that have leaders that are either insightful, either motivated, or maybe they've got a, they want to write a book or something. Maybe their, mm. their, uh, um, their reasons are not always as, as, as clear, but those leaders are dragging these organizations into the 21st century. Great example, Procter and Gamble, Gillette, mm. Gillette, the latest exfoliating razor you may, I can see you haven't used it, unfortunately, <laughs> Nick, you know, with your I'm getting rather handsome beard. Guys, so. Yeah. Anyway, if I use it a lot, as you can tell, um, the, the, the exfoliate was built using scrum and agile. Okay. This is Procter and Gamble, you know, an ancient organization, an older organization, yeah. but really has got it. They realize that if they want to keep up with their, customers, their partners, their suppliers, they need to work in quite kind of different ways. And, and so, you know, it isn't, it isn't roses, but there are roses in the garden, as it were. And it goes beyond when, when you think of that organization, you think of what, what Gillette has done, is it goes beyond traditional agile thinking. Uh, you know, oh. Traditional agile thinking, we think software. And, and yep. this is engineering, this is manufacturing, this is bringing together uh, marketing, because in, in those types of organizations, marketing drives kind of what the product's going to be, and then engineering mm -hmm. figures out how to deliver that product and so on. So it's really bringing together the whole organization into how do we deliver something and and deliver it together. And I, I think that's one of the big things that we're seeing, and one of the big changes that Agile helps to drive is that team. So you talked about incentives and, and team incentives. Uh, that's a piece of it, but it's team ownership. It's team um, togetherness. It, it's that 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 ultimately they all feel accountable, and bringing that accountability together as a team versus and, and I think even so, my wife's in manufacturing, and it's always and she's on the R and D side of it, and complaining about the marketing people and and, and complain. You know, they they you have those conversations of well, they don't realize what it takes to actually build this thing. They just have the dream. And, and by bringing them together in that team, and, and really they're, they're having their daily scrums, they're, they're, they're planning together, and, and they're having those hard conversations, respectfully, that starts to build that team and, and build them in a way that they're able to actually deliver faster and, and, and more what the customer wants. Can I just lean in? I'm sorry, we're just sort of taking over mm. here a little, Nick, but I just <laughs> want to lean into something that Eric said around it is all about the teams. One of the fundamental problems we see in many organizations is hierarchy. Because mm. if you get these massive hierarchies, they obviously there's, you know, I've got to be in control of something. I need to take ownership of things. I need to be off, responsible for certain things. I mean, that's how hierarchies work, right? And so that often undermines the ability of a team to effectively function. You know, we need to flip that so that these hierarchies become, instead of being on top of the teams, they need to be underneath the team supporting them. Think of them as, you know, those support trusses on bridges or whatever. You, you know, you have some fabulous bridges in Australia and um, yeah, in Melbourne and in places like that and in Sydney. So think of it upside down, holding up the teams. But that means, going back all the again to incentives again, that those leaders need to understand what they're responsible for in this new world. And they're doing it for very good reason. They're doing it because the teams need to be, they're closer to the problem. They need to be empowered to make the decisions in real time based on the data, the information they have. They need to have clean line of sight to the customer. All of those things are the reason why a hierarchy is just too slow to respond and too bureaucratic. So we need to flip it and enable those teams. And that's a huge challenge. 
I, I, I love this. You two have given me something to ponder. So for the first six years of the company's life, of Easy Agile's life, we did have a very simple team page. And Dave and I, as co-CEOs, were at the bottom of the page. And then you had the leaders of the pillars. So you had, at the time, like Tegan was the head of product, the leader of, and so, and they sat on top of Dave and I, and then the team sat on top of that. And it's interesting, I'm actually trying to reflect now, it's probably only in the last 12 or 18 months as we went through 40 people, that that page or that, that visualization has flipped. Mm. Um, so my, I've got an action item, obviously, to come out of this. Um, thank you, gentlemen, um, to actually go and flip it back. Because there is a, I mean, it's a communications mechanism, but if, if, if we actually put ourselves at the, at the foundation in this supporting role for supporting the folks, that, that sets the tone, I imagine, for the team members in how they, um, they think of themselves and maybe that accountability piece as well, Eric. Yeah, yeah, that's, it. that's interesting because it's, sometimes it's those little things that change how people think and feel. Um, I use I use a lot of sports analogies when I talk and, and, and meet with people, and, and especially with what where Dave was talking of, you know, empowering the people closest to the problem. Uh, if, if we have to do the same in sport, if, if 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 we have to wait for the manager to tell us to pass the ball, it's never going to happen. Right? We we've mm. got to allow the people to make decisions and make those decisions on the field. We need to apply that. To, to business as well, I'll allow the people who are closest to the problem, closest to what's happening, make those decisions uh, within the business as well. So uh, like if we come back to Procter & Gamble and we don't have to rabbit hole on it, but uh, you know, they are one of the large long lived companies. And, and I don't know about their approach in particular, but I think about GE and GE had their internal training university program and they were training their leaders training their managers how to manage training their leaders how to lead um you know how does how does a, a proctor and gamble go about shifting that conversation internally and what's that time frame because presumably you've got to start with someone that's on a team and do you have to elevate them over time through the through the hierarchy of the company it it is it is interesting i'm i'm fortunate to spend um maybe because we're both british people living in boston i'm i'm fortunate to spend quite a lot of time with um and there's videos on our site with this by the way it's sort of interviews with dave um ingram who runs r d at at uh, uh for male grooming it's called in in the gillette part of png and the, and the case studies out there but so i talked to him a lot about how you drive it in a hugely in a huge organization where they've got everything to lose right they they've got products that are amazing they've innovated those products are the products that you put put into your shopping cart as you walk down the aisle they don't want to muck that up i mean let's mm. be frank you know if suddenly because of some innovation you know there's there's no razors on the shelves uh, then I, as a, as a bald man, need a razor, so I will buy an alternate product, and it's possible that then I'll always buy that product. So they've got to be very, very careful. They've got more to lose. So we talk a lot about how you manage change, and it's all of the above. What he's done very in, in, smartly is he's empowered the product owner role or the, 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 the person, the glue role, you know, whether mm. it's using Scrum or something else, to and he's really invested in these change agents in his organization and he's definitely led by doing he's been very uh, honest and open about that and very clear that he doesn't have all the answers and he's looking for them to help him during this which isn't perhaps what you'd expect from a traditional organization where the leader might need to feel that they have the answer to all of these questions Exactly. And he's done a really, really good job of doing that. And primarily because he says, well, my success is ultimately their success. So if I can make them be a little bit more successful, there's more of them than me. So let's let's make it work, which I think is an unusually um, honest and very, uh, you know, sort of like insightful view of it. But so he's, he's driven it f predominantly through product 
sort of management ownership areas. He's then provided a support environment around that. He's then definitely advertised the successes. He spent a lot of time building cross-functional teams, the thing that Eric was talking about, and really been very careful working with their leadership. You know, if you're material science, there's a whole mm. department. If there's marketing, there's this whole channel thing that they have. Basically working with their leaders to create the environment for success to happen. And, and I don't think it's easy. Uh, I, I think there's many surprising roadblocks along the way, and I, I can't speak for him on this, but he's he sort of taken that sort of divide and conquer kind of approach, focusing on that catalyst role. How, you know, so, because you've obviously, you're providing a lot of training for, for various, well, I guess people at various levels in these companies, and, and obviously, you know, it's, it's a far cry from having a CST and a CSM and a CSPO kind of certification going back, you know, a decade, decade, decade and a half. Um, what, what's the uptake around the leadership training and what does that look like, Eric? Like, you know, is, is it renewed interest in that at the moment or are people demanding more of that leadership training? Is it fit for purpose for today's leader? So I think to, to a point it is. Uh, we're, we're certainly seeing growth in the leadership training. And as a matter of fact, Dave and I were just looking at those numbers uh, earlier this week and, or yesterday, I guess. It, is there, are there any numbers you can share um, with us? It, it's, hard to, it's hard to share the exact numbers, but we, we're seeing double digit growth in number of students taking our, our leadership yep. classes. Um, okay. Both, both um, how do you measure? Uh, so our evidence-based management classes, as well as um, our, our our leadership training, uh, but that also only goes so far because a lot of those folks, depending on how high up, especially in the organization you go, aren't willing to take lots of time out to to take such training. Um, so a lot of it happens in in that coaching. They're hiring. Uh, the, the executive coaches or, or, or the, the yeah. agile coaches that are in there, the scrum masters that are in there are actually working to, to help coach those folks. And, and a lot of it's less about the training and, and more about the mindset shift. So if you look at our, our agile leadership course, a large part of it is spent on getting people to think differently. And, and really um, some, some of it's hit, hit you over the head type of uh, activities. Uh, where it really helps to drive those points across of, wow, I need to think differently. I need to work differently. I need to treat people differently. Differently. Uh, and, and, and it's that. Uh, and, and we're seeing good success with that because that, especially when the, that light bulb goes off for folks and that light bulb that goes off saying, wow, this is different. Um, we, we have um, some exercises in our classes that, uh, you know, really get you thinking and get you, you know, there, there's, there's one, for example, where you're thinking you're doing the right thing for the customer and you're thinking you're doing exactly right until it kills the customer um, because you didn't necessarily think through the whole. It's, well, this is what the customer wanted, so we need to do it. But maybe I should have got together with the team and, and let the team make decisions. I'm going a little extreme, but um, no, I, I, I get, it's, I, I it's those sorts it. of things that, that, you know, we, we, we have to change. And um, a lot of what we do in the course is, is educate leaders on what those teams are going through and, yeah. and what the individuals on those teams need and the type of support that they need. Not how do you manage those teams? Not how do you manage those people? But how do you empower and enable those people to be successful? And I want to just rewind for a second. Sorry. <laughs> it, it, sounded, it sounded like there's a friction point in actually getting these leaders to take the time, like take the time out of the office to go and get some education. There is. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. I mean, it, it's incredibly hard when you're, if you're at a large organization in particular, when your schedule is overlapping meetings continuously eight to nine hours a day for them to take that moment to step back. I mean, everybody, I, I believe very strongly, Nick, that everybody needs to take time to invest in their own per, per personal and professional development. 
and that time is not a waste. Ultimately, it is an incredibly good investment. Yes, but yes. we it's know great ROI. And, uh, totally. Yeah. Um, even if it just resets you, you know, even if you have that moment of clarity because of it, you know, it, it's not a surprise that people like Bill Gates go on retreat uh, every uh, three to six months and he takes his big bag of books Oops. and he goes off grid for a few days just to sort of like reset. Uh, I think that that sort of time is incredibly but uh, effective. But what's interesting is we're under it, it's a, uh, in america in particular and i'm sure it's true in australia it's certainly true in england where i'm from motion is more important than outcomes it's all about the motion if you look busy you're not going to get fired and i think to some extent we learned that in school i don't know if your parents said you know said to you or when you maybe when you got your first job i was working on a delicatessen counter at, at the co-op supermarket and and I remember uh, there was an older worker there who turned to me and goes, he goes, whatever you do, when the manager walks by, Mr. Short was his name, and he was everything that that name implies. Mr. Short walks by, look like you're doing something, start cleaning something. Or, otherwise, he'll take you off and make you do provisions, and you don't want to be doing without milk, it's rancid. You know? <laughs> and I remember that, <laughs> look busy. And, um, and I think we've got a lot in our culture. I, I know that, you know, I try to take time every week. You know, I book, for instance, my lunch hour, I book it and I yeah. always try to do something in it. I try to watch a TED talk, read something, just to, just to clear your mind to think about something different. You know, I think those sort of, that time is incredibly important. Yeah, exposed However, to some new perspective, right? Exactly. Right. Even if yeah. it means, even if the stuff you're watching or whatever isn't that relevant necessarily, sometimes that lack of relevance is exactly what you need because your mind does something. A mental break. Exactly. And yeah. however, we in corporate America, and I, I, I think that's corporate in general, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. People are overly leveraged. They're incredibly busy. They have to attend these meetings, otherwise their profile is diminished. And I think that's at the detriment of the of the organization and the company. Ask, here's a question, Nick. Yeah. Uh, what, who have you helped recently? Who have I helped recently? I spend most of my time and I get most of my energy out of coaching conversations with individuals. So exactly. on my disc profile, I'm a, I've got futurist very high up. And so I love exploring what, what is your life and your career going to look like in five years time? They're the conversations that I really get jazzed by. And that's what everybody, who have you helped is more important than what have you done? Yeah. And Can, uh, I think you need to yeah. balance that. I, um, I pulled up these stats cause I thought you might find them interesting. We did a survey last year of a subset of our, our customers and we had 423 teams. So it's not a huge sample size, but 423 teams. And the reason I think about it is because there's a lot of, um, what was the statistic here? So just to give you a sense, most common sprint duration is 14 or two week, two week sprints. Um, most teams have, uh, six, um, people, um, that are involved. Um, Fibonacci in the, in the, you know, for story pointing, um, an estimation, um, 10% of these teams achieved what they set out to achieve at the start of a sprint. Wow. And most of, and so the teams that the, this 10% of teams, the subset, they did add work into their sprints, yeah. but teams that were unsuccessful rolled work from sprint to sprint. And so perhaps what it indicated to us is that there are teams that overcommit and under deliver. And in fact, 90% of them, 90% of the survey teams, it would appear that they overcommit and under deliver. And then there are teams that are maybe leaving time, Dave, for um, maybe for some education or some, you know, some spare time in their two week sprint. And they actually happen to pull on more work and they achieve that. And, and I'm just thinking about that from a sense of 90% uh, of these teams trying to be busy or are they trying to be perceived to be busy 
even if it's at the expense of actually, you know, delivering. Where are they, where are they even pushed into it? It's interesting. There's a question mm. on our uh, professional Scrum Master one, our, our PSM one test that um, often people get wrong. And, and, and I think it's a great question, which is, uh, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember it exactly, but it's essentially, you know, how much of the sprint backlog needs to be filled coming out of sprint planning? And a significant number of people say it needs to be complete coming out of sprint planning, which goes in the face of Agile and Scrum because we don't know. <laughs> there, there's that uncertainty. All we need is enough to get started. And mm -hmm. once we get started, but I think people are fearful of, well, we've got two weeks. We need to be able to plan those two weeks and we better be able to, and this, this is some of that top-down pressure that we talked about. Well, we need to show that we've got two weeks worth of work here and that we're not sitting around. So let's mm. fill it up. And, and those are some of the misnomers about Agile and Scrum. Well, it's a two-week sprint. We need to plan two weeks. Well, no, we don't. We need to have a goal. Where are we going to get to? How we achieve it is going to take time because we're going to learn as we go. As a matter of fact, um, the Scrum team that I'm on right now, um, we're running, we're running a, a three-week sprint. And two weeks in, we've actually achieved our goal. And now we're able right. to build upon that goal. And, and we're actually yeah. we we already delivered on that goal um, two, a week early. Uh, which do, is do great. Do you think, Eric, that there's a fear from leadership that um, that you know if people haven't got two weeks worth of work teed up, that they're just going to be twiddling their thumbs? I don't know that it's a fear from leadership. I think it's a perception that the workers have of what leadership is thinking. Yeah, I, okay. I think it's more that, and, and I think it's the well. We're, we said we've got two weeks. You know, we're going to, and, and they are going to ask us. Right? Management's going to say, "When will you deliver?" They're, I don't know that we'll ever get away from when will that when will we deliver question, even though we continually try to get away from that answer. Um, but they're going to ask it. So if they're going to ask it, I better be prepared, which means I better have a whole bunch of work laid out. And, and that just breaks everything that we teach. It breaks everything that we think in Agile. And, and all I need in planning is I need a goal and some idea of how I'm going to get there. And over time, let's kind of revisit it and let's continue to revisit it and 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 go to it but it amazes me how often and the, 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 the some of the answers to that question are and you have a full sprint backlog go, coming out of sprint planning you have enough to get started um i forget what some of the others are but that it amazes me how many times when i review tests have people full put the backlog. full back sprint backlog where it even says right in the scrum guide you know it's going to you're going to inspect and adapt throughout the sprint well, how do I inspect and adapt if I've already decided what I'm going to do? Who's who's the onus on? You know, if this is if it's not actually the leadership's wish that you fill up all your time and you operate at 100 percent capacity, then is the onus on the leader to make it known or is the onus on the team to engage in the conversation? It's the yes. leader. Yeah, yeah, I think Both. it's more yeah. the leader because yeah. I think they have to create the environment where the team actually yes. can challenge it and yeah. actually have that very clear conversation what what worries me about your stat is the fact that i don't i mean the first few sprints yes maybe you get overly excited maybe you fill the the sprint which you don't need to maybe you're just keen you know that's okay the mm. thing is what happens on sprint three or four or five when you, the same pattern is manifesting itself over and over again? That's worrying. And I think that speaks really clearly to the lack of help the team's having. Whether you call it an agile coach, and in Australia, I think the agile manager is, is, a, is a phrase that's used, or whether it's an agile, or whether it's a scrum master, whatever. It, it's the Scrum.org has a, has a scrum master. And the reason why we have a Scrum Master isn't because we don't know Scrum. Um, though there's some days you know, it might be questionable, but um, you know, the, uh, you know, cobbler's children, you know, all that stuff. But the the reality is, we do know Scrum. We 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 talk it, we breathe it, we love it. But having somebody that steps back and says, "Hang on, Westy, what have you done there? Have you forced, encouraged the team?" You know, to fill the sprint? Have you set them an unrealistic goal? Have you 
listen to them and ask them the questions or have you told them what you want and what do you think that's going to do you know i know that i have because i you know but oh, eric and i fund the sprints as it were mm -hmm. When we do a, when we go to a sprint review and we say stuff, because a sprint review is ultimately there to provide feedback to the team to allow them to inspect and adapt for the next sprint. You know, you can't change the past, but you can change the future based on feedback, right? Um, if I go in with, oh, well, that's rubbish, and you should do this, and what about that? Yeah, it's going to have an impact. So ultimately, we have to think about as leaders what we bring, and also have somebody often helping us to be the leader that we need to be because we get excited and we get enthusiastic and we get oh you can do this and that let's do it that sounds awesome and sometimes that can you know. and, and that's part of why i say it's it's both that's why i said the yes right it, it's on the leader but the leader needs to be reminded of that. The leader needs to be supported by that, especially by the product owner and, and the scrum master. The product owner has to be able to say no. Uh, yeah. The product owner has to, I, I talk about happy years and, and most CEOs and happy senior years. leaders. Of, yes, uh, most CEOs and, and, and senior leaders I've worked with have what I call happy years. They yeah. come from one customer or they talk to one person and heard something that do this. that one person might have thought was great and next thing you know they're putting all these new requirements on the team um, and, and i've worked in many startups and big companies where you know even at ibm that happened um yeah. and, and the product owner needs to be able to say whoa hold on that's a great idea let's think about it and and or the we'll put it on the backlog but let, let's we'll think about it later but let's not distract the team right now from what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve and that's why I say it's both. It's not just on the leader. The leader, the leader. You're not going to fully change the leader. You're not going to fully change them to not have those exciting moments. And that's what makes them entrepreneurs. That's what makes them who who they are. But the team needs to to be able to push back. The leader needs to be accepting of that pushback. Yes. And the scrum master and the product owner, as well as others on the team, need to be able to to have that pushback. I, mean, I remember very very early in my career. Um, I, I worked for a company called LogicWorks. We had a data a little data modeling tool called Erwin. And, and I remember sitting in my cube and the CEO had just come back from a meeting with one client and comes over and I was a product manager. Right. And Eric, starts talking about, we this. need to go do this now and blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, well hold on. It's like, but, you know, blah, blah, blah said they'd buy it. Well, one, did you actually talk to the people using it? Or did you talk to somebody way up here who has no idea how they're actually using the tool? Um, which the answer was talking to you know, CEO to CEO kind of conversation. And just because they'll buy it, will anybody else? And, and, and you have to be able to have those conversations. You have to build that trust with the leader from the team and from the team to the leader to be able to have those pushbacks and, and, and be able to say, that's an interesting idea. We'll take it under consideration for the future. But right now we have a focus. We've got a we've got a sprint goal and we're not gonna destroy our sprint goal because because you got excited about something. As you can see, Nick, I have a really hard time getting <laughs> any of my ideas into our organization <laughs> because uh, they ask things like this. So annoying, Nick. They say, Okay, that's great. Is that more important than these five things that are currently driving our product goal? I'm like, what do you mean I can't have dessert and main course and an appetizer i have to pick one that's just so not fair and they said well we could spin up another team and then that requires investment it's going to take time and i'm like oh gosh don't you hate it when you have intelligent well you know smart teammates it's just hard Dave and I have definitely like, so Dave Elkin, my co-founder, he comes from an engineering background and, and I come from a product background. And we've definitely noticed in the last, uh, again, probably in this, this time frame in the last 18 months as the team's grown or uh, through a certain inflection point. In the past, we would quite comfortably have conversations about what about this idea and how about that? And we'd try and tease things out and we'd tease them out with the team, but there was no expectation or like there was no expectation that that stuff would get picked up. And then we've had it. We had a few examples where like teams would go and take on and, and think that they needed to look at this stuff. And we're like, Oh no, 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 sorry. We, we should just, we should clarify that we just wanted to get 
a brainstorm or we wanted to get thought out of our head and we wanted some perspective on it. But this should absolutely not mean that you should chase it down. And so the language and, and how we've had to approach things like that or activities like that has certainly changed. I've seen that a, a lot lately, point. probably in the last two or so years. And I think maybe because of remote, it's made it even worse because you don't get all the emotion and things. But I, I've definitely seen a lot more of that of, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I've been told this doesn't translate, but I'm just spitballing and I'm just throwing an idea out there just to have a conversation. And because the leader said it, people think it's fact and that they want to do it. And then all they were doing is, Hey, I heard this thing. I'm, you know, what do you think? What's and, your and, perspective? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think as leaders, we have to be very careful to understand the impact of what we're saying, mm -hmm. because we may be thinking of it as I'm just throwing it out there for some conversation. Somebody sitting at the desk just heard, Oh, they want us to go do that. And, and and I've seen that a lot in, in companies recently, including in ours, um, where where the way something said or what is said is, is taken on as we must do this versus, hey, here's an idea, something to noodle on. So you're not I alone. Love it. <laughs> hey, Eric, I reckon that's a great place to call it. That that is, and and you have given me, you've both given me a lot to noodle on. Um, so I'd like to say thank you so much uh, from our listeners and from the crew at Easy Agile for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been wonderful having you on the podcast. Well, thank, thank you, you for inviting us. We're really, uh, really grateful to be here. And hopefully some of this has made sense. And uh, yeah, let's uh, continue to grow as a community and uh, as a world in working in this way, because I think we've got a lot of problems to solve. And I think the way we do that is people working effectively in empowered ways. So um, let's change the world, man. I love it. Okay, that's great. Awesome. Thank you.